I want to give you a few heads up on what to look for in the getting started chapter of McGrath's Theology of the Basics. Basically, you're looking for two things. Uh, first, you're looking um, at his short uh, analysis of church history. There seems to me to be a problem that a lot of us really deal with when it comes to thinking of the history of the church, and is that we don't think that there really is a history of the church. Um, Maybe we make the error by thinking that the church was born in 1517 with the Protestant Reformation, or that the church kind of really was born um, when my own church, whenever that was, started, whether it be like a, an independent church in your own city, whether it be like a denomination, um, like the Baptist church or the Episcopal church or the Methodist church, uh, or the Orthodox or the Catholic church. The reason I have this up here, and you can see that this timeline is from the Orthodox perspective, because if you were to have another timeline from the Catholic perspective, the Catholic Church would, would be the consistent theme down here. But I want you to realize that the, the history of the Church, as McGrath, uh, I think, correct, correctly uh, portrays, is something that goes back to the, the early followers of Jesus. Jesus was not the founder of Christianity. It was his followers. The, the people who dedicated their lives to the mission and the ministry of Jesus, they were the founders of Christianity. And in so many ways, Christianity was dependent upon and built upon Judaism. And so one thing you need to really pay attention to in this chapter is how he talks about the five periods of church history. And then I also want to challenge you to think forward. When he defines that fifth period of church history as the modern period, you're going to have some philosophers in your college setting that, is, that are going to argue that we no longer live in modernity anymore, but we live in what we call postmodernity. So in the next few years, should there be a sixth period of church history, which we would call maybe the postmodern period? And just a brief you know, kind of look at this. Some of this stuff you already know from your church history, but you know that Christianity was illegal for these first 300 years in Christianity. Once Rome got a hold of the faith, uh, we had a very, very interesting time, uh, especially in the 130 or so years until Rome fell. But we started to see Christians in the, the second and third, and particularly the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries, get together to, to argue about what they actually believed. You guys know also that in 1054, you had the great schism between the Eastern Church and the Western Church, between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. Um, and then you had kind of this, this really uh, interesting time in church history, the scholastic movement that he talks about. And up here, you'll start to see Luther's Reformation. 500 years ago, I'm recording this in 2017, 500 years ago was the, Protestant, the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. And just a few years later, in 1529, was the uh, beginning of the Church of England, which is the historical roots of the Episcopal Church. So pay attention to those five periods of church history. And then the second uh, major thing you need to really understand in this chapter is um, where do Christians get their knowledge? He spends the last few pages talking about epistemology. Epistemology is really just the philosophical study of knowledge. How do we know? The Christian tradition has argued that we know, okay, we get our knowledge from a wide variety of sources. I know that a lot of people argue that we simply get our knowledge directly from the Bible. But in many ways, that's simply not the case. If you look back historically, right here, the Bible was developing right here between the year 30 or 33 up until 367 of the Common Era when it was finally uh, canonized. At the very same time, doctrine was developing as well. And so he talks in the book about the Bible and about kind of how the Bible function, functions. He talks about tradition. Um, he talks about reason. And then I would even add, uh, as a lot of Episcopalians, or if you're a good Methodist, you do too, you add that we also know by experience. And so when I say up here that there are several canons of the Christian tradition, a canon is, is defined up here, a general rule, principle, or criterion by which we judge something. And so you have the canon of Scripture. We have the canon of the tradition. We have the canon of icons. Uh, we have the canon of doctors. This is uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. He's one of the three doctors of the church. And I think you, you have, and I'll, I'll conclude with this, this quote from Pope John Paul II, where he says that faith and reason are the two wings on which the human spirit rises to the contemplation of truth. So you also have reason. 
the ability to think, to think critically, to judge, uh, and to, to really invest your mind into a, a model of how you know is something you need to consider. And so by the end of this chapter, please be sure that you are fluent in the five periods of church history, and then basically in some of the canons of the Christian church or the epistemological foundation. Where do Christians get their sources 